Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello, welcome to today's presentation, Robotic Knee Surgery and Muscle Sparing Anterior Hip Surgery, Cutting Edge Technologies and Techniques in 2024, presented by Dr. Alexander Saw, Orthopedic Surgeon with the Washington Hospital Institute for Joint Restoration and Research. Dr. Saw currently serves as Medical Director of the Outpatient Joint Replacement Program at the Washington Hospital Outpatient Surgery Center and as Medical Co-Director of the Institute for Joint Restoration and Research here at Washington Hospital. He was born at Washington Hospital and raised in Fremont. He earned his medical degree graduating magna cum laude from Thomas Jefferson Medical College in Pennsylvania. He then went on to complete his residency at Harvard Combined Orthopedic Program and then a Joint Reconstruction Fellowship at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Saw specializes in total knee and total hip replacement. Well, good afternoon and thank you all for coming out today. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Chrissy, for that very kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about hip and knee replacement and some of the, some of the advances we have with robotic technologies and other advances in hip and knee replacement in 2024. So it's a lot of information to cover, so I'm gonna go quickly through some of it, but I hope to answer all your questions and at least give you an introduction to what tools we now have with modern hip and knee replacement. Quickly with my background, you heard about it. Christy explained I was born at this hospital, if you don't know, born at Washington Hospital here in Fremont, did my training out east, and then came back in 2008. So it's a real privilege to be here to give these kind of seminars and treat the patients of the community where I grew up. In fact, my father was a head and neck surgeon here for 40 plus years. My mom and my father uh, continue to volunteer at the hospital, so a long commitment to this hospital and this community. So it's a great honor to really do the same thing now, follow in their footsteps, and be here today to uh, talk to you about hip and knee surgery. So again, just a little bit about my, about my background. I do do total knee replacement, partial knee replacement, total hip replacement. We'll try to talk about some of these things, and we're always trying to find ways to do this even better. We're really a center of excellence here in Fremont, whether you know it or not. While we may be a small community hospital, we have one of the most robust and most well-recognized hip and knee replacement programs in the country because this is all we do. We do a high volume of them, and we're always striving to do them better. So we'll talk about some of the advancements that we've um, worked on here with multimodal pain management, minimally, minimally invasive surgery, more rapid recovery, leading to even outpatient joint replacement with patients going home the same day, just hours after their hip or knee surgery anterior hip replacement, which has really revolutionized how hip replacement is done in the United States, and then, of course, robotic and advanced technologies in both hip and knee surgery. Before I get to that, I do have an associate, Dr. Brian Bonner, who joined us in September 2021, extremely well-trained also from the Bay Area, Sacramento. He trained at Harvard for his medical degree training and uh, orthopedics and also specializes with hip and knee replacement. So another great um, person to talk to and another resource serving our community with advanced hip and knee replacement surgery. So this is our outline, what we're going to try to cover, and it's a lot, but I realize that the only way for you to really understand how robotic and advanced technologies help us in knee replacement surgery and hip replacement surgery is if you understand what those surgeries are, and to understand those surgeries, you need to understand what we're treating as well. So we're going to briefly try to touch all of the things you see here to hopefully give you a good foundation and understanding of what hip replacement and knee replacement can do and what it will do in the future with our new technologies. So first, we'll talk about hip and knee arthritis basics, just a little bit about anatomy. So when you look at the knee, these are diagrams of the knee, and of course, there are bones which make up the, the knee joint, the femur, the thigh bone, and the tibia, the shin bone, and the white cartilage on the ends of the bone. As depicted in that top picture on the right, this is like the white stuff on the end of a chicken bone. That cartilage lets every joint in your body be protected so that it, the joints will move freely and without pain. It's the cushion between the joints. Right? There are also ligaments and menisci and other things in that knee, and people may, in this room may have had arthroscopic surgeries or other procedures on some of that cartilage, but we will talk about what knee replacement's for in a moment. But this is the basic anatomy 
of the knee joint. The knee, if you look at it from the side in this animation, it moves, right? The top bone rolls on the bottom. So you can imagine when you're walking or going upstairs, the top thigh bone rolls on the bottom shin bone, the kneecap glides in front, and these are the patellar tendon and ligaments around the knee, the supporting structures of it. So that's how the knee basically works every day. It's like a hinge, right, bending and straightening. It's important to know that the knee and hip, they do feel three to five times body weight when walking, even upwards of seven times body weight when jogging. So every extra pound of weight puts more force on our joints, our arthritic joints, and even our replaced joints. So what is arthritis? Arthritis very simply is the loss of that cartilage at the end of the bone. So you can see on that picture on the right, that white protective layer is wearing down and you can see the bone exposed beneath it. That's where the pain fibers are. That's what becomes painful when there's no more cartilage and now bone starts to rub on other bone. So like the picture on the bottom left, rather than being smooth right, and white, now it's pitted and eroded, that cartilage is breaking down. That's what will lead to the very classic symptoms of swelling, pain, stiffness, right? Pain with weight bearing in your hips and knees as the arthritis increases and the cartilage diminishes. Why does arthritis happen? Well, make the analogy that cartilage in your joints is very much like the tire on your car. It can be bad quality rubber. Maybe the rubber wears down, right? The tread on that tire wears down with enough miles, right? Just depending on the driving habits or the activity habits of that person if the leg alignments or the wheel alignment, how that is may affect wear. But the bottom line is, is that the tread on that car tire wears down with time, similar to how cartilage can wear out in the hip or knee. So just typically wear and tear will lead to increased pain and in the arthritis symptoms we just described. And this is what it looks like again, that white cushion, that white covering breaks down and exposed bone is seen beneath, beneath. That's what leads to pain as seen in this picture. If you look on photographs, this is what an arthroscopy would do when you go into the knee with two small cameras. You can see you can see the areas where there's cartilage missing, where it's rugged, where it's flaking off the bone, or in the bottom picture, how there's just a huge pocket of cartilage missing and the exposed bone beneath. These are all examples of arthritis where the cartilage is degenerating and wearing down and arthritis is setting in. In the knee, when you're doing a surgery, this is the end of that thigh bone exposed, and you can see patches of where the cartilage is missing. It's like someone took a knife and scraped off the cartilage on the end of that chicken bone. That's what arthritis is. These people have painful knees. They can't do the activities they want to because their cushion is wearing down. How does that look on x-ray? Well, x-ray shows calcium, it shows things that are dense, it shows bones. Cartilage does not show up on x-ray, so when cartilage isn't present, you see space. So the gap between the bones there, you see on the right side of the picture, that's because there's cartilage there. That side of the, of the knee has cushion, there's cartilage present. But the only way for the knee to get close together, like on the opposite side, the left side of the x-ray, is because the cartilage is wearing down. They're grinding down through it. So by the absence of space, by seeing the bones approach each other, we know the cartilage must be wearing out. That's what it shows up as at, on x-ray. Here's a no, another picture. You can see on that left side of the picture, it's bone on bone, where there's just no cartilage or cushion. And you can see this patient also had an ACL reconstruction, an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. That's what the, the shadow is, that tunnel going through the two bones, and then the screw and staple on top to fix the graft. So we know just from this picture, this patient had some sort of injury, probably skiing or sports, ruptured their anterior cruciate ligament, had it reconstructed, and now has bone to bone arthritis on the inside of the knee. You can tell all that just from this picture. And in very serious and significant patterns of arthritis, you can see this person, their leg is incredibly crooked. You'd be able to see this as they walk through the, through the door in the hallway because their leg is out of alignment. They're so bone on bone, their leg's going crooked. And you can see the angle that, that that's happening with that knee because of the severity of their arthritis. So that's just very quickly what knee arthritis would show as, what you'll see it on x-ray or on photographs or in the operating room. We're gonna move to the hip joint and it's very similar, of course. You're gonna hear many similar themes. The hip joint, the one thing to know is that the hip joint may be in a different place than people think. So the hip joint really lives in the groin. The hip joints live in the crease of your, of your uh, groin, and that's where often people will have pain or symptoms when they have hip arthritis. Some people think their hip is in their lower back or in their buttock or other places. Often the hip joint symptoms will show up right in the groin or on the side of the hip. And different than the knee, the hip is a ball and socket. It's not just a hinge. You can see that in this cartoon, the cartilage is now blue. So the end of the thigh bone, the top side, is a ball covered by cartilage, which moves in that socket. 
So that whole ball has to be covered with cartilage to accommodate the many motions that the hip joint does. So just like the knee, anywhere where there's motion, you need to have cartilage so that, the, so that you don't have pain or limitations. So in this animation, remember, the hip is more than just a hinge that bends and strains. The hip will flex and extend, so that's one plane of motion, but it also goes outwards and inwards. It also can uh, rotate, so it has many more de freedoms and degrees of motion than a knee, but that's also why that entire ball has to be covered with cartilage and the cup it lives in to accommodate all these degrees of range of motion. So a little bit different, because again, the hip can move in so many different ways. Typical symptoms of, of hip arthritis are groin pain, usually in the front. Sometimes it is in the thigh or side of the hip. Sometimes it refers down to the knee. Some patients will come into the office thinking they need a knee surgery, and it's actually their hip that's the problem, and it cures their knee pain when their hip is, is addressed. Uh, it can, they can have locking, catching, difficulty getting up from um, a chair or low seat. They can have difficulty with shoes and socks or stairs. They have limping or stiffness, classic loss of internal rotation, moving the toes inwards or knee inwards. These kind of things are classic for hip arthritis. The bottom line for hip and knee arthritis is there's no actual cure. We don't have a way of growing natural cartilage and putting it back. In theory, we can take your cartilage cells and grow them in a lab. We just don't have a way of sticking them to the ends of your bone and making them resist all the forces when you stand on it or walk or do an activity. So we can't reverse the wear and tear of an arthritic hip or knee, unfortunately. We can do things to manage the symptoms, but we can't cure it. So similar to this car tire, once it's ruptured enough, unfortunately you have to replace it. And we'll talk about that in a moment. On x-ray, similar to the knee, we can't see cartilage on x-ray, but when you see a space between the ball and the socket, we know there's cartilage there. But then as it starts to get a little more narrow, you know that's happening because the cartilage is breaking down. Now it's really wearing down and the bone's getting harder and turning white because it's more dense. It's rubbing bone to bone. Now the hip is even eroding a little bit out of the socket. You can see it's moving upwards and outwards. And here they've even rubbed their bone away. So all these are different depictions of different levels of arthritis and how it can present, but they're all treated the same way. So we're gonna talk now a little bit about the treatments and what is hip and knee replacement. Going around the room are examples of knee replacement prostheses and hip replacement prostheses. So feel free to pass those around. You can get an idea of the weight and the shape, but th those are the implants there. And to go over first what knee replacement is, knee replacement isn't what it sounds like where you cut out the entire knee, right? It sounds terrible. No one would wanna have a knee replacement if you're chopping it here and chopping here and replacing everything in between. Knee replacement's much less than that. Really knee replacement like this picture is a resurfacing of the ends of the bone. So like the picture in the middle, you can see we just trim a few millimeters of bone and cartilage off the end of the thigh bone to put a metal cap on the end of that bone. We trim just a few millimeters off the top of the bottom bone, the shin bone, and put a metal cap on top there. Plastic then inserts in between as the new bearing or cartilage, if you will. But the concept is we only remove enough cartilage, cartilage and bone, just a few millimeters, to make space for the metal we're putting in. The metal we put in is sized to your anatomy, so it's the same shape, size, dimension as it was before surgery, is the goal of the replacement procedure. But all the muscles, tendons, and ligaments around the knee remain your own. The goal is, again, just to put these metal caps on the end of the bone, plastic in between, so that there's no more bone rubbing on bone. All right, does that make sense? It's not actually removing the knee, it's resurfacing the knee. So if you look at x-ray, the left x-ray shows bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, the middle x-ray shows a front view of a knee replacement, and the, side view, the, the right view shows the side view. But you can see how that metal implant is really just a cap, right? It just goes on the end of the bone, like the, like the picture on the bottom right, and in the middle, the plate on the bottom really just caps the end of the bone. So the concept here, again, is really more just a resurfacing of the knee. Because we do more hip and knee surgery here than anyone else in Northern California, we can do a minimally invasive knee surgery. This procedure, in under an hour, 50 minutes, 5-0, people's surgeries are done. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it can be a very rapid re uh, surgery with a rapid recovery. Total knee replacement, typically anywhere from an eight to 12 week uh, period of recovery. You can walk, bike, swim, ski, golf, tennis, hike, surf afterwards. These implants should last 20, 30 years. Nearly a million total knee replacements are done in the United States every single year and it's growing exponentially because people are living longer, staying more active, so this procedure is done more and more every day in the United States. So t total knee replacement works incredibly well. It's one of the most successful procedures in all of modern medicine, restoring quality of life, improving patient's function. 
Now, what's minimally invasive total knee replacement? That's something we specialize in here. Remember, regular knee replacement works great. Traditional surgery can work terrific, but it can require a long recovery because it's a bigger surgery, more soft tissue exposure, maybe not the minimally invasive techniques that we do here. With the minimally invasive techniques, we can do smaller incisions, less soft tissue trauma, which can lead to less bleeding, which can lead to better muscle function, quicker recovery, patients walking day of surgery, going home same day. Typically with our minimally invasive uh, procedures, patients are driving around two weeks. They can pick up the golf club and tennis racket around six weeks. So people are recovering faster than, than traditional uh, hip and knee replacement procedures. As a comparison of exposure, the left side shows you traditional exposure, right? People have, have uh, big surgical wounds, big surgical incisions, staples, other things. The surgery can go great and it can work very well, don't get me wrong, but if we can do the same surgery or better through a smaller incision with less soft tissue trauma, why wouldn't we want to do that? It takes skilled surgeons and people who do a lot of them to do it well, but that again is our focus here. In 2014, I created um, some protocols for quicker recovery with pain management. This is an example of a 95-year-old gentleman who went home day after his surgery, and this is him two weeks after total knee replacement, 95. And that's because we have better pain management strategies, blood preservation, rehab protocols, so that in 2014, all my patients began walking the same day of hip and knee surgery, and were going home either same day or next day. Prior to that, people were traditionally in the hospital for two, three days after this same procedure. What's hip replacement? Hip replacement's a little bit different. It's still replacing that joint and that arthritis, but it is more of a, uh, a true replacement where we remove the ball and socket that's worn. This cartoon is pretty funny. If you can't read it from the back, what it says is uh, the horse slash zebra on the right is saying, I can't say I'm completely pleased with my hip replacement. But we don't do that here, don't worry. Everyone's very happy with their hip replacements here. But hip replacement is removal of the arthritic ball and resurfacing of the socket inside so you get a new ball and socket. So you can see the implants, which again you can look at here. The stem goes into the thigh bone for fixation. A ball is fixed to it, which then articulates in a new cup on the pelvis side. So you get a new, a brand new ball and socket. It can be done through traditional approaches like on the left. It can through, be done through mini approaches, less invasive approaches on the right. But we're gonna talk a little bit about the approaches because they are different. So. Uh, posterior hip replacement, this is actually an amazing, this is someone local, this uh, dermatologist, she's a mother and her three-year-old son, they go through these surgical procedures and actually do a surgery. And so you can see here, this is a three-year-old child who's actually doing a pretty good hip replacement. It's on a Play-Doh model, but you can see here how with this approach, this is a posterior approach, it, how it cuts through some muscle. You have to divide the muscle to get to the joint. And then those three muscles also have to be taken down to expose the hip joint. So this is a posterior approach, um, whether it's minimally invasive or traditional, but with that approach, you have to cut through tissue to get to the joint. That, has, that works incredibly well. It's historically been used uh, for a long, long time and people do well, and it's gone from traditional to minimally invasive procedures. But this is actually a pretty good representation of what we do. It's in Play-Doh, but this is what we do with surgery. We put a cup into the pelvis, we put something into the thigh bone, so this three-year-old's doing it, albeit on Play-Doh, but he is doing a hip replacement procedure pretty well. But really, the concepts are what I want you to take away. It's getting a new ball and socket, right? It's replacing the, that arthritic joint. But the other thing to know is that with this approach, anything besides anterior approach, you have to do cut through muscle. And again, that can work but maybe there's a better way. You can see here, they try to repair the muscles, which is actually what they do in real life too, but it's never quite the same as not cutting them in the first place. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about anterior hip replacement and what makes it unique from all the other, the other approaches. The anterior approach was ad adopted by Joel Matta, who's a trauma surgeon down in LA, and he did trauma surgery through this approach, but he realized that it could actually be used to do hip replacement. So 30 years ago, he began pioneering this approach and brought it to the United States and the surgeons. With this specialized table, it gives access to the hip joint so that, as you can see on the picture on the bottom left, rather than cutting through muscle, like we just saw in that prior demonstration, you can go through naturally existing muscle planes. You can go between the muscles. So you don't have to cut them, you can simply separate them, get to the hip joint, do your surgery, and everything falls back in place. So you don't have to cut the muscle and you don't have to repair it. The benefit of that is enhanced hip stability, faster recovery, not muscle cutting, improved function, less pain, 
and the anterior approach because people are lying on their back like this, a more accurate and precise surgery because you can use x-ray live during the surgery. All these things are unique to the anterior approach. I've had the great pleasure of learning from Dr. Joel Mata. He actually has established the anterior hip foundation, which he had me president of last year. Uh, we actually wrote a book together on anterior hip replacement, and we are this year hosting fellows, two surgeons from the United States and one from Italy, who are gonna come to our site to learn how to do the anterior hip approach even better. So it's been a great honor and pleasure to work with Dr. Mata and bring his technique to our local community. And this is just some of the examples of the research and lectures I've given on this approach. Posterior approach is again on the left in red, and you can see how it goes through the hip joint and it goes through muscle, and unfortunately you do have to cut through muscle. The anterior approach is in green. It goes in between muscles in pre-existing muscle planes, uh, so you don't have to cut anything. Again, its advantages are it's muscle sparing. We can use x-ray live during surgery because you're uniquely lying on your back during surgery. So the bottom left picture is actually intraoperative x-ray where we can confirm the size and the fit and the placement of the implants, how that reconstruction matches to the other non-disease side. So we can really match things to make them more precise in our reconstruction. But all this leads to better outcomes for the patients, which we'll go over shortly. Less pain, fast recovery, better hip stability. Because this has become so popular, remember I told you Dr. Mata started this 30 years ago, it was slowly adopted in the hip replacement world, but then in 2019, over 50% of hip surgeons in the United States now adopt this approach, and it's only grown since then. So for the past five years, anterior approach is the prominent way to do hip replacement, and it's getting more and more prevalent because every fellow and resident coming out of training is doing it, and really the older surgeons are slowly retiring with their more traditional posterior and mini approaches. So anterior, pro anterior hip replacement you'll hear about is the predominant approach in the United States for five years running. This is an example of what's unique about anterior hip replacement. These are two examples of x-rays during surgery. So I have the arthritic hip x-ray on the left side of your screen and opposite normal on the right side. Because of course, that's what we want to reproduce. We want to make their diseased arthritic hip like their normal hip. Once I do the hip reconstruction, I can take another x-ray and I can literally hold that x-ray over their other, or over their hip to compare what did I correct and where should it be. I can even put it over their non-disease hip to make sure the reconstruction I just did with the implants I put in is right where I want it to be before they leave the operating room. Anterior approach is the only approach where you can do that because with all the other approaches, they don't get an x-ray till you're in the recovery room. It's obviously too late to change anything. So much more precision and accuracy given this technology we can use with anterior approach. When you look at the data, comparing anterior versus other approaches, the studies routinely show that there's improved function, early return to activities um, for two weeks to three months longer um, for patients having anterior approach to recover faster. When you look at hip stability, risk of dislocation, anterior hip re replacement has the lowest by far dislocation rate. It has the most hip stability of any approach because again, it doesn't cut through muscle it's more stable. And when you look at these approaches, this came out of Kaiser, thousands and thousands of patients comparing direct anterior on left to posterior on the right. What you can see is that lower rates of all-cause revision, lower rates of dislocation, lower rates of readmission, lower rates of fracture, all of these were all benefits of anterior approach over posterior approach. When you look at how anterior approach can work, Dr. Bonner and I are the only surgeons to do anterior hip replacement at the Institute or any of its affiliated hospitals. These are patients who are walking just hours after their anterior hip replacement. They're getting ready to go home. So this is very different than when I was in training and people on walkers or canes and stay in the hospital for two or three days. These people are going home just a couple hours after their anterior hip replacement. So in summary, anterior hip replacement has essentially no risk of dislocation with much more hip stability, no limitations on hip range of motion or precautions after surgery, less reliance on assistance devices, less pain, higher function, quicker recovery. I know that's a lot of information, but I want you at least to have an understanding of what arthritis is and what replacement is. So now I can talk to you about what you came for, the robotics. And this is really the interesting and neat part about what's happening because things are always advancing. Why robotics now in 2023, 2024? We're in a technology-based world, right? You guys probably left your home, you put on your alarm with your mobile phone, you checked your home cameras, you came in your self-driving car, you have your Roomba on at home. All these things can happen because we have so much technology all around us. This, this center, was, uh, center video was me at the San Francisco airport trying to just get a cup of coffee before f a flight the other day. 
can't even find a human being to give me coffee. You have to go to one of these uh, robots, you scan your card, you put in what you want, and then this robotic arm makes your coffee. There's no people anymore. This is San Francisco Airport. So technology is everywhere, and you all live with it every day. 2007, this is amazing. Look at this robot that they have, and this robot is playing this classical piece on violin. 2007. 2014, they make a robot here that can play ping pong with this ping pong champion. And in 2023, they have this robot that look is self-automated who will pick up this bag, it will walk through this staircase and do all kinds of maneuvers, all self-automated. Technology is everywhere. It is amazing, right, how much it is advancing to see that a robot can do activities like this. So if we're living in a world where robots can do things like this, they must be able to do a knee or a hip replacement, right? So let's talk about how robotic surgery plays into the surgery. The first thing you need to know is, as great as those videos are, current hip and knee replacement is not done autonomously by a robot, meaning surgeons don't push a button, leave the room, and the robot does it. It's a, currently, it's a tool that surgeons will use. So like in this picture here, it's some sort of tool surgeons are in control of, but it's robotic assisted, just to clarify. The surgeons still do the surgery. The surgeons are still in control but these robots are advanced technologies to help do the surgery potentially even better. It's a continually evolving field. The literature is mixed about it, but robots are provided um, for these surgeries to hopefully have even better results. One thing to know is that typically the implant companies are the ones supplying the robots. So what that means is if you want a robotic surgery, you have to use the implant that that robot sells. So that's one of the caveats of it, right? So if someone says they do robotic surgery and everyone in their, in their, all their patients get robotic surgery, the odds are very likely that all those patients are getting the same implant design and company because you have to use the one the robot sells. So that's one limitation in modern day, but that may be changing. Most facilities only have one robot because they're expensive. We're on the leading edge of technology and we work with a lot of robot companies. So we actually have three robots and three different options here. We're the only surgeons, again, Dr. Bonner and I doing robotic surgery at our institution. Here's a closer look at what it is. This is one example. This is a robot where the robot's the machine, as you see here, and there's actually a saw on the end of its robotic arm. The saw is controlled by me as a surgeon, as you can see in these videos, and the saw will only turn on if it's at exactly the right plane of where I plan the surgery. So if I go out of that plane, it turns off. It will not let me cut except where I planned based on a CT before surgery. So that's where its accuracy and its precision can come in. You can't deviate from your plan because again, the robot can control it. So that's what's truly amazing about some of these technologies. But again, it's a tool. It's something I'm using in my hand to do the surgery more precisely. What are the goals of robotics? We're hopefully having a more accurate surgical procedure, more precision to what we plan, customization. Because we get a CT scan before surgery, we can plan the surgery ahead of time and customize patient A's knee to their knee, patient B knees to their knee. And if someone has a prior trauma, deformity, or fracture, we can personalize that knee surgery to that specific knee. So it gives us the ability to customize our surgery and personalize it to each individual. The other added benefit, which I'll show you shortly, is that these robots allow us to get some soft tissue feedback and information so we can actually balance the knee and get soft tissue stability better. So in the end, when you put all that together, the hope is we have a more reliable surgery, we have better alignment strategies for the individual patients to reduce outliers, to reduce revisions, have better outcomes so that people can again do even better than they already have done with our traditional knee replacement surgeries. In many ways, some think, think that robotic surgery will be a game changer. It, th I will admit that the literature is still being evaluated. Just because you have a ro robotic knee surgery does not guarantee you'll have a better result than someone who doesn't have a robotic knee. Obviously, there's a lot of factors in it uh, based on the surgeon and the planning and the execution. Just like your computer, you give a computer bad information, it can spit out bad information. So you still have to have a skilled surgeon to know how to use this technology well, but it does give us a tool we didn't have before. Again, the ability to use a plan, like on the bottom, that's a CT scan of the patient's knee, and then before surgery, planning the surgery and, and being able to modify that before you've even started your surgery. So it gives us the opportunity to plan, modify, execute that plan, and then even verify that result. 
This is a, a short video showing um, how robotic technology is used. This is a CT scan in many different planes and angles evaluating the patient's knee. And the green are the proposed implant sizes and positioning. So we can change the position, we can change the size, we can do the whole simulated surgery on the CT scan before even going in the operating room. So that gives us more efficiency, it makes the surgery quicker. This is a cadaver, so this is just an example. But those trackers, those blue markers you see on the leg, allow the robot to know where the leg is in space. And then what happens is, as surgeons, we will register the bone. So what we do is we're using a uh, device to hit these points so that the robot knows and knows how to match up the leg in space with the CT scan it has in, in the computer. Right? So we have all that information that we pre-planned with the CT scan in the robot. This process is mapping the knee in real life right in front of us and mapping that to the CT scan so the robot knows what's where. Now when the knee moves, the robot knows where that knee is exactly. So again, we're mapping out the anatomy so it will match up with the CT plan we have in the robot. So that's what gives us precision. Once you perform the surgery, or even before you perform the surgery, now with those trackers, you can stress the leg, put it through different ranges of motion, and, it, and you can see on the bottom right the surgeon is stressing the leg. The numbers here are changing based on the tension and the gaps of the knee. So we're getting some soft tissue feedback. Where is it looser? Where is it tighter? Where will balance be best? This robotic technology is more than just cutting the bone. It's giving us soft tissue feedback, ligament balancing. And then this is the robot. The robot before I showed you had a saw on the end of the arm. This robot happens to have a guide on the end of the arm. So what happens here is that guide stays in place only where we planned the surgery. It will move if the patient's knee moves on the bed or, or whatnot, the, the guide will move with it so that this cut that the surgeon does, again, the surgeon does all the cutting with the tools, is only in the right plane, the correct plane that we planned. So that's what's giving us that precision and accuracy. It's a tool that we are using to make these bone cuts perhaps even more precise. Okay, so these are the different robot variations. Again, last robot, the saw was on the end of the robot and the surgeon would use it and guide the saw. With this particular robot, there's a guide on the end of the robot and the surgeon has the traditional saw and simply cuts through the slots. So this helps us with the bone preparation portion. Again, this is a cadaver. The top of the bone was, uh, the, the end of the thigh bone was just resected, and now the top of the shin bone is being resected. Again, just a few millimeters to make space for the eventual metal implant that will go in. And, then, and those metal implants will be the same shape and size and dimension as the knee before it had arthritis, and that's the goal of this procedure, to restore that knee to where it should be. And then again, more preparation. This is just cutting the bone so that it will accept the inside of that implant. But all these cuts are extremely precise and it's hard to appreciate, but if the knee moves or if the you know, person holding it, it moves left or right, the guide will actually move exactly in plane with it. So the cut can't deviate from plan. Once you put in the knee replacement trials or implants, you can again test the soft tissue balance. You can make sure that the knee is exactly where you want it to be. The soft tissues are responding how you want it to be. You can verify your result before the patient leaves the operating room. This is where the true value of robotic technology seems to be. So it seems that robotic assisted knee replacement gives us opportunity to potentially give us more insights on where to best place the traditional implants we use, flexibility in customizing how we do the surgery, efficiencies because we know what we're gonna use sooner and we can go right to that plan because we planned it ahead of time, and the benefit of providing a very customized knee replacement for that individual patient by using this technology. And here's another uh, example of a third robot technology, and this one actually is in Fremont. So this company is local. They also get a CT scan just like this, and that data is loaded into their computer. What's unique about this robotic technology is that it's a handheld device, and I'll show you. Here's the CT scan. You can see it makes a 3D model, and then you can plan your surgery, but that's the robot. It's not a big arm like you saw before. It's not something big or large that has to be added to the operating room. This is a small device that I can use in my hand, portable and handheld. But the brains of it is in the handheld piece and in the camera. So in the camera above, it can again track the knee and know where it is. And what happens is with this robotic technology, it will help me place the pins and the guides that I do prior to surgery with great accuracy. 
You still have to register it just like this so that the robot knows where that knee is in space. So this part is uh, very similar to what you saw before, but it's how the robot executes the surgery that's different. The surgeon again does the surgery. We hold the device, but that device will only turn on. Those pins will only go in when it's in the exact plane that we planned before. If it's in the exact plan we, or in the exact plane we planned before, now we can put our guides to know that we have a very accurate cut. We can adjust it during surgery. We can make changes if we need to. We can use the robotic technology to make um, modifications we have to. But again, this robot places these pins. It's amazing. You can move it, and if you move it in plane, it will turn on and spin. You move it out, it turns off. So there's a self-correcting feature, highly accurate. And again, this company is right here in Fremont. So really amazing to be on the forefront of that. And, I, and this robot, <coughs> excuse me, is unique in that it is open platform and you can use multiple different implant companies with it. That's on the knee side. Very quickly, I'm gonna go over the hip side. With a hip surgery, as you remember, we can use x-ray. So we can plan things. We can take an x-ray on the left, plan our surgery, and then use x-ray uniquely during the surgery. Anterior hip replacement's really the only surgery where you can take x-rays during the procedure and make instant changes. But can we have technology to help us with that? Again, the x-ray, intraop x-ray, as we looked before, overlying our hip reconstructions over the arthritic hip and the opposite normal hip is a great advantage to give us better precision and accuracy in our hip reconstructions. But one of the advantages of this technology is that we can now use that image and load it into a computer. And what happens here is this computer can automatically know the angles and placement of where these implants are. So because it knows the anatomy, this computer in this screen will tell us where is that implant going? So live during the surgery, this surgeon is putting in the cut portion of the implant and this x-ray is automatically measuring the degree position, how much angled it is, how much angled forward it is, but that's what those numbers are on the top. You, as he's putting it in, he's checking with the picture to make sure it's going in exactly the place he wants it to. So he can do this live. If it's not going where he wants to, he can change it, he can modify it, but he has confirmation during the process that the implants are accurate, not waiting for an x-ray in the recovery room to hope that the implants are accurate. So that's where this technology helps in hip replacement. This company has an, an augmented, or sorry, a, um, an AI technology where it will learn and it will show implant position based on those x-rays we were taking. So in summary, robotic knee surgery and advanced technology for anterior hip replacement, it's here to stay. It's improving outcomes. It continues to evolve and get better, and patients are benefiting. It's changing the way we think about performing hip and knee replacements. It potentially can lead to superior outcomes and faster recoveries. The demand continues to grow, both for patients and for surgeons alike, because it benefits both. It will continue to evolve, of course. It will continue to improve, and we see things are, are getting better and better each and every year with the new advancements. Only certain surgeons and only certain centers have experience with robotics and advanced technologies. But I just went over some of, the, some of the newest and most advanced technology we have here. Lastly, I'll talk very briefly about our unique program. While all these things are important, good surgery, minimally invasive surgery, anterior replacement, and robotic and advanced technologies, you can't underestimate how important it is to have a good program, which we uniquely have here. At our joint restoration uh, program, we have educators, nurses, therapists, educational binders, online classes. All these things help patients get through surgery faster and better. We believe education will help with that. We have fellowship trained surgeons, anesthesiologists, techs, nurses, and therapists who specialize only in joint replacement. So that's unique. Other facilities, they, these, these team members do various things. We have dedicated um, disciplines just for joint replacement, our primary focus. We do high volume, so we do a lot of research as well. We present at meetings and on a national level show the outcomes we have. Fremont's here, and even though we're a small community hospital, we draw patients from all over California. And when you look at actually over the United States, we have people coming from out of state, Hawaii, Alaska, East Coast, coming to our program specifically for our hip and knee replacement program. Health grades you can find online. Uh, we have some of the highest rating or the highest rating in the state, even more than the other major academic centers in the area, really uh, top 5% of the nation and often best in California. Consumer Report the same, ranking us better than many of those academic centers in the area and the only hip and knee program in the Bay Area to actually be rated top in both hip 
and knee replacement. And lastly, all these advancements have helped us lead to outpatient joint replacement, faster recovery, people able to recover at home rather than in the hospital. We started this in 2015. We were only one of two centers in the, in the country. And what we found is that people can and will recover faster at home. Again, hip replacement going home same day on the bottom. Top right, a woman sent me this in my email. She went home that day and sends me this video of her walking and dropping her cane, which I thought was hilarious. And this on the left, an 82-year-old two weeks after a major revision surgery. Patients are going home quicker, having less pain and recovering faster, getting back to what they want to do. And this is some of the research and the presentations I've done on outpatient joint replacement. This is something we focus on here. And why do we do all this? Really, in the end, it's so that people can have better recoveries. We love to hear from our patients how they're doing. This patient's dream was to jump out of a plane. I don't know why, but it was. And so after his joint replacement, he actually did it and sent me that video. This woman on the top right is a, a sand volleyball player and very, very athletic. And you can see her squatting way more than I could ever squat after her double knee replacements. And I get this video one day when I'm on vacation on the weekend, I open it up, it's my patient showing me her, she is um, water skiing two months after her double knee surgery. So it's wonderful to see these things, that's why we do all, all of uh, what we do, to get people back to the lifestyle they want. So all this information, I know it was a lot, but I wanted to make sure you, you could truly understand what we're talking about with robotic surgery and advanced technologies. It's on my website. So the website on the bottom, sawortho.com, you can visit, you can see a lot of these videos and inf information. I'll close with these other videos that patients sent, patients who he likes to paraglide. You'll see what that is in a moment after hip replacement, um, wakeboarding after knee replacement, doing her dog agility and golfing two weeks after surgery. So. With that, thank you all for your attention. I know that was a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you again. Dr. Saw, we do have a couple questions uh, from our Facebook audience, and then we'll take questions from our uh, live audience. So one of the questions is uh, regarding a double knee replacement or a single knee replacement. Is the recovery the same? Is it, would you go home with a double knee the same day? So single knee replacement, again, typically people are going home same day, maybe spending the night if they need to. Double knee replacement is two major surgeries in one city. So it is more surgery. Imagine getting out of your chair right now, both your knees were just operated on. So you have to be healthy, you have to be motivated and have good support to do it. With our minimally invasive techniques, people recover so quickly after a single knee surgery, often people will do one and six weeks later do the other because then they're overlapping the recoveries. If you say it takes three months to recover from a knee surgery, right? If you do the first one and then you do the second one six weeks later, you overlap the second six weeks of the first knee replacement recovery with the first six weeks of the second knee recovery. So you're done with both in three months time. So most commonly people do it that way because it's two individual, more predictable surgeries rather than one major unpredictable re uh, recovery of two double knee surgeries. But we do do double knee replacement. But again, it's more, more challenging for the patient. They have to be motivated and able to tolerate it. But those patients only go home the next day. They're not spending much longer. It's just you have to do the recovery of two knees at the same time. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, who would be a candidate for robotic knee surgery over a traditional non-invasive? Really, anyone can have a robotic surgery, technically. You'd have to go to a surgeon who obviously does it. Uh, you have to have some, you don't, you, you don't want to have completely abnormal anatomy or prior surgeries or a lot of hardware. In some cases, actually, those patients are even better for robotic technology, but those, that's the only time I can think of there's something truly unusual with the anatomy that you wouldn't use robotic technology. But in general, really, anyone can be a candidate. It just depends on what the surgeon does, what they're most skilled at, and what the, what the patient is interested in. But really, anyone can be considered for it. Okay, and the last question we have is, um, is robotic sur uh, knee surgery faster or less time in the EOR than a traditional knee surgery? So that's one of the misconceptions and that's one of the hopes you'd have with robotic surgery is that maybe it's faster, right? We know it can be more accurate and precise. Hopefully it would help the, the surgery be quicker. But because of the setup, the registration and performing the surgery, at first robotic surgery takes longer. It actually takes more time because there's more involved to get it set up and to, and to do the surgery. As you get better and more familiar with robotic surgery, you can get it very close to time neutral to, tradi to traditional knee surgery. But for many, pa many surgeons, robotic surgery will actually add a little bit of time. So it's not necessarily faster. It might take a little bit more time. 
Okay, thank you. And now we can take questions from our live audience. If anybody, oh, go ahead. Uh, for the hip surgery, what's the typical surgical time? So with minimally invasive knee surgery or minimally invasive anterior hip surgery, in someone who does a lot of them, like myself, we can perform the surgery in an hour or less. It's a spinal anesthesia, typically numb waist down. So no general anesthesia or intubation required. You're sedated as much or as low as you want, but you're breathing on your own, which is nice. So safer and more comfortable, quicker recovery. After that hour or less surgery, whether it's a hip or knee surgery, people are walking on it that afternoon. And again, many going home that same day. Thank you. Our next question. Why does weather play an important part um, on your on your joints? Arthritis, yeah, on your joints. Some people will say when they have arthritis that they can feel it, whether it's temperature or bar barometric pressure. Some people with arthritis can feel some difference, some pain, some stiffness, or different symptoms. We don't know exactly why, but some people can feel that. Some people it doesn't bother them at all, but some people are sensitive to it. Okay. If after the surgery, will you still experience that? Typically not. Because with hip and knee replacement, right, you're getting rid of the arthritis, the inflammation, and the worn cartilage. So typically, people don't um, feel that symptom anymore. No. Here we go. In your practice, are, are you doing exclu exclusively um, anterior hip replacements? So I started doing anterior hip replacement back in 2016 or 17 when I worked with Dr. Mata and I did a gradual transition. I used to do primarily mini posterior approach. And, and again, that can work well. But as soon as I did anterior approach, I saw dramatic improvements in patient's recovery. I was happier with how the surgery was going even better than what my previous successful other hip approaches were doing. So I went exclusive to anterior approach, yes, back in 2017. The traditional route would be advisable? Or good, good question. The traditional route of the posterior approaches, the main time people would use it is either one, you're doing a revision on someone who already had a posterior approach, so you'd want to go through the old incision, so you'd, you'd, you'd revise through the prior a surgical approach, or two, if they had a major an, uh, anatomic deformity or hardware, right, prior fracture, screws, plates, something else you had to take out, the posterior approach is very extensile, so surgeons are more familiar with it. You can make much bigger incisions, do more complex uh, revisions. So that would be one potential case to do through a non-anterior approach. But even revisions, complex surgeries, those can all be done through anterior approach as well through the right surgeon. Since it's relatively new technology, is it uh, insurance typically uh, on board with the it is. So everything I talked about here today is covered by insurance. These are all tools and technologies that patients don't pay for. The implant companies supply to help make the surgery go better. So it's not an added cost, any of these things, to the patient. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've had a couple of uh, ankles replaced, the same one twice, actually. But, and... <clears throat> Pre-surgery, you go in and, you know, you're being processed into the surgery and everybody in front, they're going, well, the anesthesiologist comes in and talks to each patient. Okay, we're going to give you a uh, local, uh, what, uh, spinal anesthesia. Um, and then comes to me and I go, well, you know, I have extensive uh, stenosis. Uh, and they go, okay, general. And that's always trouble me because, well, it's either this or this. There's there's no analysis to see. And the anesthesiologist, just like all of you guys, you're very busy on the day of the surgery. And, and, and this guy just makes a snap decision. Well, okay, general. It's like, well. Um, yeah, that's it, really more of an anesthesiology preference. And some anesthesiologists are hesitant to do spinal anesthesia for someone who has a history of spine or back problems because they don't want to exacerbate or worsen anything. But that would really require a discussion with the anesthesiologist, some planning ahead of time. But that's, that's all something that can be done, but that's something that has to be coordinated with the surgeon ahead of time. Yeah, I tried that one time and it's like, oh, well, you'll talk to him on the day of the surgery. It's like, I get five minutes. Yeah, you know, that's your, that's your, I'm lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's your particular surgeon and program. Just depends on where you go. Yeah. Thank you. Any question here? Based on the three options you were mentioning with robotics, how do you make that decision which tool you're going to use based on the joint? 
for knees specifically, are you asking, or just in general? Or? In general, yeah, in general. both. So remember that in its current form, most robotic technologies, you have to use the implant that that robot sells. So rather than prioritizing how we're putting in with the robot, I try to put the emphasis on the patient's individual anatomy. So I'd rather pick the implant I think will suit you best, whether it's shape or size or bone fixation, right, activity level. I wanna personalize what implant I think will work best for that patient and last a long, long time, and then work backwards. If a robot's available for it, offer it, but if not, I would rather put the emphasis and priority on the implant that's going to be with that patient for decades and not prioritize how to put it in in those 30 minutes because maybe I don't want to use that robot specific implant for that particular patient. So I always try to prioritize the patient's needs first. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I'll get it right up here and I'll be back. I have two questions. First of all, this looks pretty heavy. Then is your knee a lot heavier? You gain weight with this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want to blame it on me later, holiday weight, you can. But that implant, you're right. That one is heavier because in a knee, the top portion can't scratch. It has to be scratch resistant because it's moving, right? As you saw in that video on the plastic. If it scratches at all, it's going to act like sandpaper on the plastic. So it's heavier because it's more durable and scratch resistant. That's why the one in your left hand is lighter because that's not seeing any motion on it, right? It's just fixing the bone. And the hip implants that you're holding are lighter because those are titanium. The bone's gonna grow into it, they can be lighter. But specifically because that implant is what's rolling against the plastic, it has to be scratch resistant. And currently it's the heavier metal that allows that to occur. The second question I had is, as a runner would prepare for a marathon, a lot of training, what do people, how do they prepare for coming in for their surgery? What should they be doing? That's a great question. You want to be in the best shape and best prepared you can for an elective hip or knee replacement. You know you're going to have it. You have time to prepare. Get in the best shape you can. The stronger you are, the better shape you are in, the better your recovery will be. Now, obviously, that patient, if they have an arthritic hip or knee, it's going to be hard for them to do certain exercises. They might not be walking or hiking or doing as much as they normally would, but find the exercise they can tolerate walking, biking, swimming, lower impact activities, strength training, do all that. Come to surgery in the best shape you can. Treat it like you would any other sporting event or anything else. Do some preparation, like you say, and they will have a quicker and better outcome. So on average, how long does this ball and socket would last? So what's amazing about these technologies and these materials is they can last 20, 30 years. So these implants can, can theoretically last a lifetime. They're so durable, I challenge people to wear it out. I tell them, go ahead and try. It's really hard to do. In the worst case scenario, if in 20, 30 years, they are somehow able to wear out some of that plastic, these implants that you see are made so that the plastic can be removed and replaced without moving anything off of the bone. So in theory, in 20, 30 years, if the plastic wears out, you could pop it out, put in a new one. That person has a brand new, fresh hip or knee replacement at 20, 30 years. But technology is also going to advance in the next 20 or 30 years, so I'm sure it'll be even better by then. But these things, for most intents and purposes, last a lifetime. Is it the same for you? Same, same thing. Uh, I have two questions. So for the first, uh, for the knee uh, replacement. So if the bone-to-bone -bone situation is actually caused by uh, the joint misalignment, uh, you know, how would this method, I mean, how all uh, be better than the, you know, traditional one? Um, so, yeah. Remember, these surgeries are meant to replace the cartilage that's worn down. It's meant to restore the alignment that that knee or hip was supposed to be. So it should put things back to where it used to be. So with all those things, muscles should work better, pain should be less, function will be improved. So that's what these replacements will do. Okay. And the second question is, you know, do you have a kind of like a age or suggestion, because uh, we're talking about the, uh, the, the time period of this material. And then like, you know, if person, you know, like, like 40 or 50, they get this re knee replacement and then 20 years later, like, you know, do again, right? And then that would be like 70. So we have patients as old as in their 90s who've had this surgery because they are living life. They want to keep active. That mov movement is what's keeping them healthy. So they have these surgeries at 90. 
We have patients as young as in their 40s because they've had injuries, trauma, fractures, and they can't function. They can't do their quality of life or living and not have the surgery, so that they can't wait till they're 60. So they have to do it in their 40s. Of course, we're cautious and careful about doing it in people very young. We never wanna do an unwarranted surgery, but when people need it in their 40s, it can restore their quality of life. And again, it should last 20, 30 years, and if they have to have something redone, it's better to address it then than to not be able to live their life now, because they have to work, they have to take care of their family, things like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And maybe add one more question. So uh, for your patient, um, like, um, uh, like for the runner, like how they recover, like after they recover, can they still be able to do like, like mother marathon? Or yeah, after hip and knee replacement, we don't recommend marathon running. That's a lot of impact. They can bike, swim, ski, golf, tennis, hike, surf, anything like that. But we try to eliminate the amount of jumping and running on it because it's a lot of impact. So we try to minimize that. One question. Uh, I attended a seminar oh, pre-COVID, so it's what, four years ago, three, four years ago. And I don't know if I heard it in the seminar or just surrounding uh, information, but at that time they were talking about exposing, um, exposing the ceramic material the high levels of radiation, and they found that it was making it virtually impervious to wear. Did anything come of that, or is that the technique that's being used now? That's what we use now. So that has to do more with the preparation of the plastics. The plastic liners are irradiated in a way so that they don't wear, they don't oxidize. The ceramic is usually the other bearing in the hip. Uh, with a knee, it's metal on plastic, but that's what makes the plastic so durable. So that process is what's giving it the 20, 30 year longevity. Here we go, one more question. Hello, uh, my question is regarding uh, steps for diagnosis. So if somebody has pain in their hip, do they start with a primary care physician? Do they see you? How does it go? Great question. So if you're having hip or knee problems, certainly you can try the non-operative methods, which we didn't go over here for lack of time. You can talk with your primary care doctor to see if it's something that therapy would help or an injection or non-operative treatments. But if you have an x-ray, if you've had diagnosis or suspicion, then you would come to see uh, someone like ourselves who can help evaluate uh, your joint with an x-ray and an examination. Our wonderful new patient coordinators are actually in the back. So if people have questions about what would be involved with scheduling or to have an appointment, they happen to be here in the back there. April uh, is back there um, as well. And so anything, any questions you have, they can answer them. But on our website, it will also list non-operative treatments, surgery short of hip and knee replacement. All of that is on this website here. But the first step would be try the non-operative things and then either see your medical doctor or come see us with an x-ray and evaluation. Uh, question, question for you personally. Um, on With Medicare and a, and a supplemental plan, you don't need a referral. Would you Do you prefer a referral or can people just come straight to you? You don't have to have a referral. Of course, we want to make sure that people who are coming have an idea that it's their hip or their knee. Sometimes it can be confusing. It can be other things like their back or other referred pains. So we generally try to help as well. Our wonderful staff can help guide. But you're right, Christy, you do not need a, a referral with many insurances. You can call our team and they can tell you uh, how quickly we can see you. We're going to uh, halt the questions for a moment. We could catch Dr. Saw after. I do want to make a comment about your younger group of uh, potential knee and hip replacements because uh, I talked to a lot of people in their, you know, mid fifties, maybe just approaching 60 with a lot of pain. And they're being told by, you know, other physicians, other practices and other organizations that, oh, you're too young. And they say exactly that. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to get old fast if I don't get moving. And, mm -hmm. and so it's great to hear that the philosophy in your, your area is to get people moving, stay active, live longer. So that's great. So uh, do you, will you be able to hang back for a moment for a couple questions? Very briefly. Very, very uh, briefly. Yeah, I apologize. I have to run to another meeting. But any questions you have, you can go to our website. Um, it should answer them. Our team is here as well. They can answer questions. You can email us as well. But I thank you all for coming and taking the time. I hope you found it helpful and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.